I'd like to welcome you all to the second in Cornell University Press's Authors in Conversation series on behalf of myself um, and my co-editors. Um, my name is Paul Kramer of Vanderbilt University, um, and we're proudly into our 15th year of this series with um, uh, a new array of uh, editors in this field, um, along with our Cornell Press editor, Sarah Grossman, who's coming on board. Um, and we're here to help launch and celebrate and discuss two exciting works in this series. Uh, Oliver Charbonneau's Civilizational Imperatives, America, uh, Americans, Moros, and the Colonial World, and Colleen Woods' Freedom Incorporated, Anti-Communism, and Philippine Independence in the Age of Decolonization. Um, we'd like to start by just uh, having my co-editors briefly introduce themselves. And, uh, and then I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists and uh, we'll have them briefly introduce their works and then we'll just open it up for Q&A. So um, Sarah, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hi everyone, um, my name's Sarah and I am as of two weeks ago, the new sponsoring editor for the US and the World series. I'm very excited uh, to be working on this. I will say I first encountered this series when I was an editorial assistant way back in the day in 2010. Um, so it's been a long journey uh, for my to come, me to come here to you. I probably know some of you from my other Cornell University Press hat, which is as the editor of the Southeast Asia Program Publications, which as it happens over the past three years has seen an exponential increase in proposals about the Philippines. So I'm super psyched to be bringing my two, these two things together. Um, I think there's a lot of vibrancy and excitement in the field and i really look forward to this webinar so thanks uh judy thanks so much paul and i just wanted to ask you if you could make emily a participant um she's uh, our she's our um fourth um editor in our series okay yeah sorry let me uh let me figure out the zoom side of this uh yeah if you can go ahead and, and continue and i'll work on that Thank you, and thanks everybody for joining us. My name is Judy Wu. I'm a professor of Asian American Studies at the University of California, Irvine, and I also direct the Humanities Center. It's been such a joy to be part of this series. Uh, one of my works has been published um, with US in the World, and I was so grateful for Paul um, for his mentorship in that, in that process. And I'm currently working on a study of Asian American and Pacific Islander women who participate in the 1977 National Women's Conference. I'm really looking forward to hearing from Oliver and Colleen and celebrating their work. And hopefully th those of you in the audience who might be interested in working with us in the future. Thanks, Judy. Um, ben. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Coates. I'm a historian at Wake Forest University. I'm really excited to be a member of the uh, co-editorial team here at uh, the US and the World series. Um, my own work looks at uh, histories of, of law and empire, and I'm also currently uh, researching the history of economic sanctions. Um, um, I wanted to just again extend a thank you to everyone who came here today to help us um, uh, talk about these fantastic books on the Philippines. It's been a uh, completely insane semester, so I'm glad that everyone could make it. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing um, ideas and thoughts and, and proposals from those of you in the audience. Uh, if you have any anything uh, you're interested in or, or questions, please um, uh, be in touch. Thanks. Um, so I'm just using my extremely rudimentary uh, Zoom non-skills. I've just added uh, Emily as participant. Um, uh, I don't know if, if she can hear us. Uh, Emily, are I'm you? I'm probably on here. Great, fantastic. Okay, just in the nick of time uh, with my Zoom skill, non-skills. So um, yeah, so <laughs> you can introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Conroy Kretz, and I'm a historian at Michigan State University. Um, uh, like Judy, my, my, my first book came out with the series as well. So it's a real joy um, to be here on the editorial team with everyone. Uh, my own work looks at 19th century American religion and foreign relations. Um, I'm currently working on a book on um, missionaries who worked for the State Department and sort of participated in American diplomacy in the 19th century. Um, so looking forward to hearing from many of our participants in the future about wanting to work with us too. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Um, okay, so uh, just to kind of kick things off, um, 
you know, we, as I mentioned, we have two really exciting books uh, in the field of kind of Philippine American 20th century history. Um, this is a, a field that is, is a you know, incredibly rich field. And as I was looking over the uh, list of attendees, I realized that many of the people responsible for that fact are here among us. So I, before we begin, I just want to thank those of you who have um, whose work and scholarly labor have gone into making this as rich a field as it is. I'd like to just thank you for that work and for and for attending. Um, I really feel like in important ways uh, we're really here uh, because of the, the collective work that that you all have done. So um, with no further ado, um, I'd like to uh, go ahead and just briefly introduce our speakers. Uh, so uh, we'll begin with um, uh, Colleen Woods. Uh, Colleen Woods is an associate professor of history at the University of Maryland, where she studies US history in a global context with special uh, emphasis on Asia and the Pacific. Her research interests include US empire, war and transnational politics, decolonization and global imperial history. Before joining the history faculty at Maryland, Woods spent the uh, 2012 2013 academic year as a Mellon postdoc fellow in the Department of History at Amherst College. She received her PhD in history from the University of Michigan in 2012. Uh, she's currently working on a second project that will bring together histories of US foreign affairs, labor and capitalism through a history of US military and military contractors recruitment and reliance on low wage Filipino labor in the post-war Pacific. Um, yeah, it's really my honor and pleasure to introduce Colleen. I've known her a long time since our, our days together at Michigan. Um, so uh, Colleen, if you could briefly uh, introduce your project, uh, we'll, we'll each have each speaker speak for about eight to 10 minutes on their project, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So take it away, Colleen. Great, thanks so much. Um, I'm going to read from something because if you know me, I will talk well over my 10 minute limit. So um, my eyes will be down off and on for a minute. Um, I want to thank everybody for, first of all, we have 77 people here. That's amazing. It's super exciting. Um, it's very weird to have a book come out during a pandemic when you don't actually get to see, you know, all the scholars that help you along the way. Um, I want to thank Paul and the editors as well. Um, so I'm going to talk a sort of brief overview about the arguments of the book primarily. So Freedom Incorporated considers the U.S.-Philippine relationship from the 1930s into the 1960s. Um, this was a period of fracture in the global imperial system. And I show that Filipino governing elites and their American allies used claims about anti-communism and U.S. exceptionalism to strengthen uh, the position of the U.S. in the Philippines, even after Philippine independence in 1946. The overall claim of my book is that American and Philippine anti-communist ideologies and political projects laid down a roadmap for what US expansion would look like during the age of decolonization. As the US looked to strengthen its influence and presence in the Pacific during and after World War II, it promoted the Philippines as a model for decolonization and a guarantee of what alliance with the US could provide. And I argue that the Philippines and especially anti-communist Filipino elites served as the linchpin in the construction of what I call a decolonized US empire. Throughout the book, I illustrate how Americans and many elite Filipinos in both the colonial and post-war post periods promoted the idea that the exertion of US global power was inherently anti-imperial and therefore fundamentally different from European colonization. But as I detail in the book's first chapter, the US, which is one of many imperial powers in Southeast Asia. And in that chapter, I show that US imperialism in the Pacific um, both drew on and departed from imperial models of Britain, France, and the Netherlands. Um, furthermore, as Paul and Oliver, and also many people on um, this webinar have detailed Americans racialized conviction that Filipinos supposedly lacked the political capacity to govern themselves was a primary tool for Americans to establish colonial legitimacy. This made it difficult for Americans to claim that their rule stood apart from the global color line drawn by other imperial powers. Therefore, as a former American colony, the Philippines was a critical site 
and which US policymakers believe they could distinguish US intervention and decolonizing countries from the histories and contemporary policies of European imperialism. Both Americans and anti-communist Filipinos projected this exceptional vision of the Philippines and its political and social order onto the stage of global politics. Um, Freedom Incorporated examines how US anti-communist politics were put to use by American policymakers and their Philippine allies to explain how US intervention could exist alongside Philippine independence. The functions of anti-communist politics in the Philippines operated differently, um, operated in different ways during the early and middle 20th century. Anti-communists wanted to curtail communism's popularity on the islands, but they wanted to do more than that. Um, they were also interested in cultivating an anti-colonial nationalism. They wanted to convince Filipinos that post-colonial freedom could be guaranteed through a national commitment to anti-communism. So in the book, I look at um, a really diverse set of anti-communist actors. These include American and Filipino politicians, um, intelligence agents, military officials, um, members of paramilitary organizations, state bureaucrats, um, as well as international development and foreign aid technicians. Um, and I consider how these anti-communist act actors and their networks um, extended US imperial power in the Pacific by attempting to disarticulate the US from other histories of empire, um, imperialism, and in particular, the colonial racial order. Um, they had a deep conviction um, that anti-communism was the ideology of democracy and that imperialism, um, which was fundamentally anti-democratic, was a descriptor for communist Russia, but not the democratic United States. These anti-communists argued that the Philippines transition to independence in 1946 proved the righteousness of this Cold War political binary. They argued that Philippine independence should serve as an example to the rest of, decolonizing, uh, of the decolonizing world, um, and especially other former colonial nations in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. Um, thus, Freedom Incorporated shows that anti-communist politics were entangled with US imperial uh, exceptionalism. So significantly, I show how uh, American and Filipino elites commitment to casting the Philippines as a model colony made possible the Philippine state's own use of violence against its civilian population. For example, even though Philippine and American um, intelligence estimates stated that the threat of communist takeover in the islands was severely limited, um, the US heavily supplied weaponry um, and training to the Philippine armed forces. This legitimated Filipino elites campaign against a left-wing rebellion um, in the late 40s and 50s that was being fought to undermine the coercive um, and often brutal uh, and unchecked power of landlords. By showing that US imperial exceptionalism was a central element in the constitution of American global power, I demonstrate that assertions about um, the anti-imperial intent of American policies were bound up with anti-communist politics um, and often with disastrous effects for the populations in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. Um, in effect, and really in short, I argue that anti-communist anti politics um, severely restricted the horizon of political possibilities within the Philippines. So the first half of the book demonstrates that US imperialism and anti-communism in the 20s, um, 30s and early 1940s became closely intertwined with American political ideas about the colonial order um, and the place of the US within it. So this is a period when Marxist and Leninist inspired anti-colonial movements um, in particular forced American policymakers to grapple with the meaning of colonial control of the Philippines and what it meant for the United States place in the global imperial order. Um, the book then moves through World War II and into the era of independence, um, illustrating how these ex exceptionalist claims from the pre-war period were used to support and obscure US anti-communist interventions. Um, thus, I analyze how claims about US imperial exceptionalism changed as the Philippines transitioned from colony um, to independent republic and as anti-colonial movements gained steam through the early Cold War period. 
Um, so that's a sort of general overview of the book. And I just want to take like one or two more minutes to talk about um, the sort of historiography and how I came to this project. Um, so most histories of US engagement with decolonization offer narratives of US intervention um, and anti-colonial movements um, that begin in 1945. And there's a lot of reasons why this makes sense. Um, but for the Philippines, this periodization aligns with the beginning of essentially post-colonial nationhood and independence, um, and thus produces a story about the US role in decolonization that te tends to erase the history of American empire in Southeast Asia. Um, furthermore, as the US is often um, uh, considered a sort of latecomer to the imperial game and frequently characterized an, as an aberrant empire um, that ceded to ter territorial control for economic dominance, the US role in decolonization is often refracted or understood through the lens of the Cold War. Um, as a consequence, continuities between US imperial power and the colonial and post-colonial eras have tended to fall from view. So my book seeks to sort of change this lens to bring a different picture into focus by examining the transformation in the US-Philippine relationship from the 20s and continuing to the late 1950s and beyond, uh, Freedom Incorporated brings the, or seeks to bring, hope, hopefully I bring the discursive and structural components of US imperial power into clear view. And thus more generally, I seek to sort of reconceptualize the relationship between the United States um, and global decolonization. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Colleen. Um, so uh, our second speaker is uh, Oliver Charbonneau. It's my great pleasure to introduce him as someone who has admired uh, his work for many years. Um, um, Oliver Charbonneau is a lecturer in American history at the University of Glasgow. He received his PhD from the University of Western Ontario in 2016 and taught at Brock University, King's University College and Huron University College before landing in Scotland. His work on US colonialism has appeared or is forthcoming in Diplomatic History, the Journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, <clears throat> Modern American History, and the volume Crossing Empires, Taking U.S. History into Trans-Imperial Terrain. Civilizational Imperatives, which we'll be introducing today, is his first book. He's presenting, uh, he's presently working on two major projects. The first, a collaborative initiative on the global history of industrial education from the early 19th century until the early Cold War, and a monograph on the idea of race management in the progressive era of the United States. So uh, like Colleen Oliver will speak for eight to 10 minutes. And um, as he's speaking, if folks have questions that they'd like to uh, ask um, either speaker or both, uh, go ahead and uh, start putting those into uh, chat. And, um, and after Oliver is, is done, we'll, uh, we'll turn to your questions. All right, take it away, Oliver. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thanks for hosting, and, and thank you to the other editors for uh, for organizing uh, these conversations. Uh, and to all of you uh, who, who are able to join us today, uh, hello from uh, very rainy, very dark, uh, and very locked down uh, Glasgow. Uh, as Colleen said, it's a weird time to have a book come out, uh, but in some ways I think it's been fruitful uh, in that uh, for these types of events, it's, it's created a, a greater quality of access uh, that doesn't necessarily exist uh, on campus. So maybe some silver linings there. Um, I wanna start uh, by just talking a little bit in sort of a general sense about uh, what the book is about, because I uh, understand that uh, oftentimes the, the topic that I'm, uh, that I'm writing about is, is not familiar to all. Uh, and then just sort of think just briefly about uh, the sort of aims that I had for it, again, in, in, in a relatively general way. So advance apologies to, uh, to probably the many specialists in the audience for, for any sort of necessarily reductive framing here. Civilizational imperatives uh, concerns variations of U.S. Uh, and later Christian Filipino colonial rule on the major island of Mindanao and the smaller ones of the Sulu Archipelago in the southern Philippines, uh, which due to the ethno-religious composition of their majority populations were semi-partitioned from the remainder of the Philippine archipelago for much of the American colonial period. Uh, the book spans uh, roughly, uh, although with some deviations, from the Spanish-American War in, in 1898 uh, until the eve of the Second World War when, uh, 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 when the Japanese Empire invaded, or the Second World War in Asia, I guess. Uh, 
the Southern Philippines was and is home to 13 ethno-linguistic groups that are collectively referred to as Moros. Uh, these are Muslim peoples who comprise a, a major population base in uh, Western Mindanao and the islands of Sulu. Uh, and it's also home to um, other indigenous groups collectively known as Lumad, uh, but they are mostly beyond the scope of my book. Uh, so the book itself is, is a close examination how, of how Americans designed uh, and enacted colonial rule in the South. Uh, it is about local and regional responses to U.S. colonialism uh, and also about patterns of violence that persisted throughout the period uh, and indeed, uh, as Colleen's book also suggests, uh, lasted well beyond it. One of my primary interests here was in exploring the varieties of US colonial thought that produced the sub-state in the Muslim South and about uh, how ideas of race and territory drawn from across American imperial domains and beyond not only inflected the, con the colonial construction of the South, uh, but also ran up against, interacted with, uh, and, and was, were modified by uh, regional power structures, so both native and, and Euro imperial. The first half of roughly the first half of the book considers these racial and spatial fantasies and the ways they informed the structuring of the colonial state uh, and how they shaped institutions like court systems, public and missionary schools, uh, agricultural colonies uh, and directed marketplaces, uh, among other spaces. Connected to this, uh, of course, was the production of state violence, uh, which was rationalized by colonial authorities uh, with tutelary language uh, like that used to describe the benefits of the colonial classroom for Moro children. The persistence and local fragmentation of this violence across the entire colonial period suggests that homogenizing accounts of a Moro war uh, that ended when the US Army ceded power to civilians in 1914 uh, obscure uh, more than they reveal. Beyond this, the book is also concerned with matters of scale and connection, uh, framing US colonialism in the region, not only as a regional story, uh, but also one with diverse links to the continental United States, uh, Muslim Southeast Asia and the Middle East and a range of other empires. Uh, in the US, Moros uh, visited uh, as participants in human displays at the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. Uh, they toured East Coast metropolises as visiting dignitaries and they attended college in the Midwest. Fascinated by their colonial wards, Euro-Americans produced an array of fictions about them from children's adventure novels to radio serials to Hollywood films. But connection went beyond a straightforward colony metropole binary uh, and civilizational imperatives considers how both Moro groups and American colonials were enmeshed in political, uh, economic and cultural networks uh, that, that transcended imperial boundaries. So those in, in a nutshell are sort of some of the major areas of focus. My aims for the book were relatively straightforward and, and I hope these are realized in your readings of it. Um, the first was to give a fuller accounting of the colonial period in Mindanao and Sulu than previously existed in the scholarship uh, on US foreign relations. Um, hitherto, uh, most of the heavy lifting in this area, uh, including by some of the people here, uh, has been done by uh, Philippine studies scholars, by Southeast Asianists and a smattering of US-based sociologists and anthropologists. Um, but with a few notable exceptions, uh, Americanists have mostly read uh, the U.S. presence in the southern Philippines as a lingering remnant of the Philippine-American War, uh, with scholarly interest generally ebbing uh, after the U.S. military leaves the South uh, in around 1913, 1914. So, I wanted to more fully investigate the nearly half century long history of US colonialism in the, in the region uh, where military encounters were only one piece of a much larger story about imperial power, about identity, about integration, about resistance and about accommodation. Uh, and to express this by studying the, the granularities of colonialism in, in classrooms in courthouses in prisons and plantation fields and, and other sites of interactivity. Uh, I also wanted to texture our broader understandings of U.S. empire in a region that often gets limited attention, even in accounts of the American ruled Philippines, uh, or indeed in national histories uh, of the Philippines itself. A second aim I had was to attend to and, and contribute to as well uh, the growing scholarship that places the United States within the connected worlds of empire uh, at the dawn of the 20th century. Uh, I wanted to, in, in other words, to anatomize a U.S. colonial state in a manner that would be familiar uh, to scholars studying European, Japanese, uh, or Ottoman imperialisms. Uh, 
Um, global histories of the United uh, U.S. Empire tend to spend a lot of time on macro perspectives, uh, which is productive in its own way, but, but I was interested in how sort of applying a similar lens to a regional container, in this case, um, the Muslim South, could illustrate in a more specific and detailed way uh, how empire was, was built and performed. Uh, or in other words, how border crossing, borrowings and transfers enacted by colonizers and colonized uh, structured everyday colonialism. Uh, but I'm conscious of time here, so I'm gonna wrap it up there and, and we'll, we can open it up to questions. <laughs> Thanks, Oliver. Um, so, okay, so we've gotten some questions coming in um, and uh, uh, we've got about a half hour left. So if you could, uh, yeah, continue to send questions along and, uh, and I'll go ahead and pose them to our authors. So, um, okay, so uh, we have a comment from Ronald Johnson, compliments to uh, Colleen Oliver on their books and engaging talks. Um, so Ronald asks, how you all see your work being used by instructors in courses on diplomatic history to engage students, particularly undergraduates who have rudimentary knowledge of Philippine American relations during the periods that they address. Oliver, do you wanna go first or? I can't see Oliver uh, anymore. Go, go ahead <laughs> if you, you wanna uh, go. The question was uh, how do I, imagine my work being used by instructors doing diplomatic history? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Um, I, so what I would be really interested in having scholars use my work for, in, in, in hopefully a chapter, um, would be to sort of resituate um, a heavy focus on Vietnam and Southeast Asia um, in the post-World War II period as sort of the dominant um, sort of site of intervention for the U.S. Um, it certainly is. It's a large-scale war, um, but there's other things happening at the same time. And in fact, Filipinos are participating in that war. Um, so I would be interested in, in having my work used to sort of complicate our story about Southeast Asia during, during the Cold War. It would be one example off the top of my head. Thanks for that that question. Um, so, you know, my book doesn't really deal too much with with sort of higher level diplomatic issues, but you know, I think it may be useful in, in sort of the context of, of diplomatic history or U.S. and the world courses, and just sort of thinking about um, how some of these. Um, uh, discussions and, and sort of policies directed towards the Philippines in, in you know, the first half of the 20th century translate into, uh, as I was saying in the talk, into everyday colonialism. You know, we, you know what uh, what these sort of high-level military figures like like Leonard Wood, who's who, who are down in the Moro province, um, uh, uh, are, are doing. Sort of, um, it's it, it's very much sort of a, a, a sort of a close look at at, at the daily life of. of uh, empire there. Thanks, Oliver. I'm, yeah, I'm also wondering with, you know, even for uh, in the field of uh, diplomatic history, where the emphasis tends to be so strongly post 45, and even very presentist that, you know, even the idea that there is a deep century old history of US Muslim encounters and interactions centered in Southeast Asia vis a vis the war on terror, right, where there's a deeper history that we need to situate contemporary um, U.S. discourses around Islam, you know, um, I wonder if that might play a, a role in in helping kind of depresentize contemporary diplomatic history when it comes to U.S. Muslim imaginaries that your book, I think, will will really provide. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, I wanted to be sort of careful with, with that, just um, simply because I, I and, and you've written about this as well, Paul. But you know, I've seen I've seen that sort of narrative instrumentalized in 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 you know, sort of perfidious ways, uh, not least by, by the president, uh, outgoing president of the United States. But, um, you know, I, yeah, I, I, I was sort of cognizant of that and conscious of just sort of thinking about, about U.S. Islamic interactions without necessarily wanting to um, create too much of a genealogy there, you know, in some ways, but also create a genealogy in other ways, you know. All right, yeah. Great. Uh, so Naoko Shibusawa asks, uh, she's a congratulations to both authors. Uh, she's excited to read both books. And she says uh, she wants to know what is what most surprised you as you would um, as you research your books? Um, what did you not expect to find and how did that shape your arguments? Another good question. Uh, Oliver, you want to go first? You want me to 
keep going first. Go, go, you go ahead. We'll, we'll just do you then me. It gives me more okay. time. <laughs> I mean, the, my answer is goes back to sort of the very beginning of this project, which is my dissertation. And um, what I really thought I was going to write about was essentially how Americans brought the Cold War to the Philippines um, as a sort of way to legitimate continuing intervention. Um, and certainly that's part of the story, but what I found when doing archival research in the Philippines was that the sort of pull factor was much, much stronger than I expected, right? That Filipino elites were again and again sort of pushing this very um, binary, um, sort of very traditional, um, the world split into narrative of the Cold War, um, both one, because they seems like they very much believed it, but also as a way, a strategic way to get more and more resources from the United States. So it kind of upended the way that I had originally approached the project. Yeah, I mean, th thank you. Thank you very much for, for that question. Um, in terms of what, what surprised me as I, as I researched the books, I, I suppose, you know, when, when I started out on the project, I, I didn't have a much of a sense of, of the way that um, the relationship between Americans and Moros in the Southern Philippines and, uh, evolved in the ways, you know, the way that U.S. narratives about the Southern Philippines shifted as, as we moved, you know, closer to the, the Commonwealth period in the 1930s. Uh, and so I, I suppose I was, I was sort of surprised to, to see some of the um, perhaps uh, unusual or unexpected strategic relationships that develop between certain Moro elites um, in the 1920s and, and um, particular uh, uh, interest groups within, within the American colonial state and, and back in the United States who, you know, perhaps were advocating for deferred independence, you know, um, Moros who were, were more afraid of, of uh, uh, Christian Filipino hegemony. Uh, than they than they were of, of the continued U.S. presence. So I think that that was quite surprising to me. Maybe not to to anybody who's who's spent more time uh, researching the topic, but certainly when I was writing the dissertation, it was great. Uh, so we have a question from Jonathan Milagrito. Uh, question for Colleen: To what extent did American intelligence collaborate with uh, Filipinos in preventing nationalist politicians? like Senator Claro Recto, who ran for president, who were vilified relentlessly to the point of never achieving higher elective office. Hi, John. Thanks for your question. Um, so to what extent? Um, so I don't know in particular about Claro Recto. Um, they did certainly uh, uh, collaborate with um, uh, um, Filipinos to prevent particularly um, sort of anti-American nationalists, right, really pro-Filipino um, uh, politicians from succeeding to higher office. Although, I mean, the, the, the question of nationalism is kind of a tricky one, right? Because um, the most sort of famous case of an intervention, intelligence intervention is for, with Ramon Magsaysay, and he's absolutely a Philippine nationalist, right? So really it's about the sort of the kind of nationalism that American policymakers find palatable, right? That which is essentially, will this will this nationalist go along with essentially US interest in the Philippines? Um, great. So we have uh, sort of two questions I'll combine, which kind of deal with uh, research and research process and sources. Um, so Chris Capazzola says, uh, two awesome books, congratulations to both authors. And he'd like to ask uh, each of you to talk about the archival and other sources you used and the opportunities for other researchers to dig deeper uh, into these sources, especially in the Philippines. Um, and uh, let's see, we have a, a question um, uh, from Paula Bautista asking about acquiring sources during the quarantine and what it's like to be preparing a book during a quarantine. So maybe thinking about, you know, both the sources you consulted and, and uh, for people that are conducting research now or in the future, what, what challenges do you think um, might be facing them in terms of quarantine? Uh, I mean, I mean, in terms of the in terms of the quarantine uh, question first. Um, 
uh, you know, just because the process of, of publishing a book can sometimes be extended, um, you know, I was lucky enough to, to have this basically wrapped um, before uh, COVID hit. So that, that hasn't been as much of an issue. Uh, in terms of preparing to publish a book in, in quarantine, um, yeah, I guess it just has involved less less traveling about <laughs> to talk. I mean, just more more time spent on Zoom, which I think uh, everybody Betty can relate to. Um, but but otherwise, you know, I, I haven't uh, noticed that that much about it. Yeah, sorry. In terms of the question of sources, I guess that was the other question. Is just about if you could speak to some of the archival sources. Yeah, I mean. For sure. I mean, the, the, you know, researching researching Mindanao and Sulu is um, a bit of a different proposition than than Luzon um, uh, and, and and the Visayas, uh, just simply because um, the region itself is is kind of you know still in, in this sort of colonized state uh, within the nation state. Um, so. You know, for me, it involved um, snagging some sort of digitized sources from Cagayan de Oro, um, um, you know, what I could of Philippine newspapers, um, uh, really sort of a, using data mining software on sites like archive.org uh, and Hathi Trust to uh, pull down basically everything that had been digitized um, on Mindanao uh, that I could find and sort of make it text searchable so I could you know, find the most useful stuff. Uh, and then beyond that, I mean, this this book is is largely a creature, uh, you know, admittedly of the US colonial archives. Um, so records from the Sulu Sultanate were, were brought out of uh, Mindanao um, uh, after the Moro province folded uh, in 1913, 1914. Uh, and then, you know, there's just sort of bevies of, of letters and, and petitions um, uh, from Moros uh, connected to the, to the US colonial regime or in opposition to it um, that, that crop up in, in sort of really unlikely uh, archives, large and small uh, across the states. Thanks. Colin, Colin, do you want to speak to the source question? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, on the question of quarantine, wow, I'm really glad that I was able to have all my research done before quarantine. I'm on sabbatical right now this term and um, trying to get the second project underway. And it's just, it's been entirely stalled because of, of quarantine. The National Archives have been closed since mid-March, right? And I don't see them opening anytime soon. Um, there are, I mean, I shouldn't be so doom and gloom about it, right? There are possible, a lot of possibilities out there for um, online research, but for my particular project I'm working on, it, it hasn't, I haven't been as lucky. Um, on the question of archive sources I use, I mean, like Oliver, mine is heavily a colonial archive. Um, the US National Archives was um, really, I would think the, the sort of bulk of my records. Um, but something I wanna wanted, I wanted say about that, particularly for, um, graduate students perhaps on this um, or younger um, junior faculty is that um, the US National Archives and particularly if you're looking at military records, which I did, they have this amazing capacity to suck up records um, that are um, originate in another country or from another population. So I found a, a lot of Tagalog records and Tagalog language records in the US National Archives. Um, and I had a lot of sort of trouble finding you know the sort of equivalent when I was doing research in the Philippines right so there are a lot of sort of opportunities if you can ha spend the time digging in U.S. National Archives for records that are have been collected by U.S. authorities but have not been produced by U.S. authorities. Thanks um, so question from Stephen Rodriguez uh, for Colleen um, how might the strand of American exceptionalism you examine in your book have interacted with Philippine exceptionalism? Did the mm. Philippine you see, uh, uh, you study, see American exceptionalism as tying into a larger exceptionalist Filipino narrative? If so, what were the unique features of that narrative? Wow, that is a really good question. Um, and I'm not, I'm not totally confident that I um, can come up with, with a great answer off the top of my head. This might be something I want to sort of think about and come back to. Um, so as I understand the question, did the Philippine HU study see American as tying into a larger exceptionalist? Yeah, so I would say, um, yes. I mean, the, the, the Filipino elites, particularly in the late colonial and early um, post-war period, see a sort of utility in um, promoting the idea that the Philippines was both an exceptional colony, 
um, and an, uh, a sort of model for decolonization, right? So in that way, um, U.S. imperial exceptionalism is very much tied with the sort of development of Philippine exceptionalism um, in the in the early uh, post-war and early Cold War periods. Um, I, I'm not competent or sort of educated enough to, to extend it further than that, quite honestly, um, but certainly that is a component of um, the argument in the book. Thanks. Um, so question for Oliver from Judith Escalona. Um, how did US colonization of the Philippines vary between the Christian North and the Muslim South? And how did the prior earlier layer of colonization by the Spanish and the Arabs impact American colonial practice? I mean, it, it, it differed uh, significantly in that um, uh, the, the, the South ends up as, as a militarized sub-state um, that, that's governed by uh, this sort of strange U.S. military civilian hybrid uh, apparatus, um, it, you know, really up until um, uh, the eve of, of the First World War. Um, this group, uh, which is led by, by these sort of major American military figures like Leonard Wood and, and John Pershing, Tasker Bliss, uh, has their own sort of particular ideas about um, what they want uh, for, for the Moros and, and to a lesser extent the Lumad um, and, and how they sort of intend to, to transform the region um, to sort of in some ways be a, a sort of vanity project to show how the military can do colonial state building uh, better than, than the civilian administration in the North. Um, they inherit, uh, uh, like, like the authorities, the American authorities in the North do, they inherit plenty uh, from the Spanish while at the same time uh, rhetorically disavowing uh, Spanish models too. Um, so, you know, while they're sort of, um, uh, uh, avidly reading uh, Jesuit uh, uh, ethnographic accounts of the southern Philippines. They're also talking about sort of how Spanish rule was degraded, but at the same time, you know, they're building on the pre-existing architecture of Zamboanga. Um, uh, they are, they're, you know, consulting um, uh, with uh, Spanish Filipino planters for, for in information uh, on uh, uh, Moro groups. Um, you know, there, there are sort of plenty of antecedents there. And I think probably the most important one is, is that, you know, to a certain extent, they, they absorb, particularly in the early years, they absorb um, Spanish um, sort of a, a series of sort of derogatory stereotypes about the Moros uh, from the Spanish uh, and, and use them as rationalizations for, for the violence they perform. A uh, question from Julie Green uh, for both Colleen and Oliver. Um, she would like to know more about the challenge for U.S. or Filipino authorities of labor management and how that shaped the book's uh, uh, projects. Oliver, you want to go for it? Uh, you know, you, you, you go ahead. You've written more on labor than I have. <laughs> um, okay, I think I, how the challenge of labor management shaped the history of the books you examine. Um, this is this is a great question, Julie. Um, I think it, it sort of speaks more to my second project than, than, than this project. Um, huh. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't, how, I don't have a good answer for this, Julie. I mean, this is, um, Julie's my colleague, so this is um, particularly fun. Um, I mean, I really, it, labor management doesn't really factor into my book, I, I guess I have to say. I mean, the one thing I can think of, um, the one thing that's relevant, and I, I don't really actually think it's quite what you're talking about, um, is the way in which um, the US really starts to cultivate and rely on soldiers and armies of foreign nations um, in the moment of decolonization and post-independence. Um, that's not necessarily a labor management problem, but it's a labor, I mean, it's certainly about sort of who's doing the labor of war making um, in the US empire for, for US imperial expansion. Um, that would be my answer right now. Um, but yeah, thank you uh, as well, uh, Julie, for that question. Um, and this is, um, you know, in terms of the book, this was this was a sort of question that 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 always shadowed the book and, and didn't actually end up making it 
uh, into the book in, in as, you know, as explicit of a fashion as I wanted it to, but I, but I do have an article uh, that's, that's coming out um, mid next year in modern American history that, that talks directly to uh, labor in the Southern Philippines. And, and I guess the short answer to that is, you know, it, uh, uh, it shaped the history immensely uh, in that, um, you know, in, in the sort of secular narrative of, of U.S. empire uh, in the southern Philippines, labor was was really the sort of uh, one of the foundational building blocks for, for what Americans imagined as uh, uh, the modern Moro citizen, right? And in particular, um, forms of wage labor, uh, whether it be uh, on, on the plantation uh, or in these sort of nascent um, uh, manufacturing um, operations in places like Zamboanga, um, forms of wage labor that that would sort of create um, uh, modern consumers, uh, sedentary uh, moros, um, uh, basically uh, people who are able to produce and, and consume the products of global modernity, um, and and you know when the Americans performed violence, it was often you know either directly or indirectly connected to. Um, uh, at least in, in the ways that they legitimated it to um, uh, Moro issues with sort of taxation that came out, you know, came out of uh, uh, sort of labor, basically head tax where, where if you didn't pay it, you'd be forced to labor um, for X number of days a year. And you, you see a lot of anti-colonial resistance coming out of that. And then Americans justifying um, their violence uh, by saying that you know uh, the Moros weren't weren't sort of properly uh, giving their um, deference to the colonial state, so like labor is is all over the story. So Ali A uh, asks, uh, as someone uh, interested in interdisciplinary relationships between literature and history, uh, are there any fictional accounts of your subjects that spring to mind or might be recommended? Um, I can I can jump in there first, Colleen, to not to not make you go first. Well, I mean, uh, for, you, you actually use literature in your in in like the, in in your uh, as well. So yeah, um, yeah. We I mean we we see uh, we see we see a number of fictionalized accounts of the Southern Philippines cropping up in the United States in the first couple decades. Um, actually, and beyond uh, uh, in the United States, um, um, there were um, boys' adventure novels. So, like you know, the the type of stuff that you would see and. Uh, more commonly examined in the British imperial world, uh, you see that uh, books about, you know, Uncle Sam's boys fighting, fighting the Moros, um, a, a woman who, um, who lived for, for a time, an American woman who lived for a time in the southern Philippines, um, published a, a collection of stories called uh, Piang, the Moro Jungle Boy, um, that were sort of a, a sentimentalized and, and sort of you know, highly uh, orientalist uh, account of uh, a so-called good Moro who collaborates with the Americans to his benefit and, you know, showing all of the different sort of um, positive outcomes of American rule. Um, a, a long running play on uh, in Chicago and then on, on, on Broadway was called The Sultan of Sulu, uh, which was a fictionalized account by George Aid um, of uh, 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 Sultan Jamal Karam II, uh, um, under a slightly modified name. Um, there was a movie made. Uh, there were radio serials. So yeah, I mean there was there was plenty there. It, it only sort of uh, disappears from from the public narrative um, after the Second World War. Colleen, were there fictional or literary elements or things that surfaced in your research? I mean, certainly, so Carlos Bulasan, who, um, you know, is a famous um, Filipino and uh, Filipino American author, um, wrote a novel, The Cry and the Dedication, um, about the Hook Rebellion. And there are, in fact, a, a couple of novels um, about the Hook Rebellion. I, I don't really, I don't um, uh, uh, integrate um, literary work into, into this, this is, um, but um, I would highly recommend it. And also, um, interestingly, there's an author named Dennis Johnson, and I'm kind of forgetting the, um, the uh, Tree of Smoke, who um, has a, a book that's really about um, kind of Vietnam, but it begins in the Philippines. And I remember writing my dissertation and somebody being like, this is, this is your dissertation in novel form. So I recommend that as well. Um, 
so question from Teresa Ventura. Um, uh, let's see, uh, for Colleen. Um, she says, you mentioned that the Cold War foreclosed many possibilities for the post-colonial Philippines. Could you expand on these possibilities and their relationship uh, to the older colonial state, i.e. developed in tension with or opposition to American colonialism? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Teresa. Um, so the real, so after World War II, there is uh, the Hook Rebellion that's happening and it is, um, it grows out of post-war guerrilla politics. Um, but at the same time, there is a sort of movement, which um, I think is sort of best called a sort of popular democracy movement um, that is not, um, that is sort of related to the hooks, but not a part of it. Um, and it has to do essentially with um, what I think the equivalent of kind of like a New Deal program um, for the Philippines. Um, and those are really quickly sort of associated as kind of um, part of the communist program, right? And so this really a, the attempt to um, basically incorporate individuals who um, either were part of the hooks or adjacent into a, sort of the democracy, right? Say that, you know, are we want to participate in, in politics, right? Through voting and through being elected and have our interests represented um, is, is essentially collapsed in the late 1940s. Um, and so that is the sort of the horizon of political possibility that I see as having sort of closed down in this moment um, because of anti-communist politics. I think that answers your question, yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, so a question from Eric Kreiner for Oliver. Uh, he asks, if the archipelago-wide goals of the United States were the same despite the discrepant motivations and allegiances within the anti-colonial resistance, do you believe that historians should continue to separate the Philippine American War on Luzon and the Visayas and the campaigns against the Bangsamoro in Mindanao, or should we frame both together for the purposes of articulating a more comprehensive colonial narrative? Uh, I'm, I'm going to sort of um, split the difference here and, and, and say both. I mean, the reason the reason that I um, I wrote mine, my, my work specifically on the Southern Philippines was just because I, I saw um, a lack of comprehensive accounts uh, of that particular topic. And, you know, particularly when, when we're talking about um, histories of the United States in, in the world as they relate to the Philippines. Um, but I mean, at the same time, I think that there, there sort of would be, be some value in um, looking at these these contexts in a shared way. I mean, you know, to the best of my knowledge, there's there's no um, uh, sort of comprehensive book length study of, of sort of how violence was produced in both of these spaces, you know, across the entire colonial period. Um, they certainly shared personnel, they shared resources to a certain extent. Uh, they were in dialogue with, with one another. I mean, Americans and, and um, uh, peoples of the Philippines I islands uh, alike. So um, I think I think I think there is there is value, you know, sort of um, separating the, the two uh, for for purposes of analysis, because, you know, in, in particular, the Moro province was a very, very different space and it had its own sort of peculiar rhythms and logics. Um, but but I think a, a more sort of comprehensive history that that sort of bridges those gaps rather than just sort of filling one of the gaps like my book does. I think that would be incredibly useful. Thanks. Um, well, I'd like to ask you all a question and we're running out of time here a little bit, uh, but uh, you know, thinking that there might be uh, young scholars, uh, emerging kind of grad students looking for topics, uh, uh, scholars looking for future research agendas. And I'm just wondering if, you know, um, thinking about them, if there were topics that you came upon um, or that, you know, inspirations that were kind of sparked during your research that you thought, I really want someone to do a project on this. Um, this would make a terrific, you know, article, uh, book, manuscript, et cetera. And if you could just share um, some of what those were. I can go, Oliver, since you answered the last one. Um, yeah, I love this question. This is a great question. Um, so I will say that my book is um, very Manila centric um, and it is really focused on political elites. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done, I think sort of gets at the perspective um, at people at sort of a more local level or the provincial level 
um, some of that work has already been done in terms of the sort of hook side of the story, right? And I, I know uh, Vina Lanzona is on here um, and without her book, like my book would not be possible. But I, I, I actually mean the sort of the anti-communist this side of the, the local level. I mean, there's just a lot of work to be done um, just in sort of getting um, at the sort of social history of what the immediate post-war years and what the transition to independence looked like in the Philippines that um, you know, I couldn't do because of um, you know, my sort of my language skills or time and resources, let alone the sort of length of a book, right? Um, the other one would was something that um, I sort of discovered relatively late um, in doing research, and that was this, this discovery that um, uh, Filipino anti-colonial actors were very much tied in and very much a part of um, the global circulation of um, primarily communist uh, uh, organized anti-colonial movements in the anti-war period. Um, and so I think sort of tracking down um, these individuals, some of them go to study um, in the Soviet, Soviet Union. I know there are Russian language archives um, on these individuals. I don't read Russian. I, I, I located them, but I, you know, I couldn't use them. Um, but also their sort of connection with um, other anti-imperial, anti-US imperial movements in the interwar period, I think is, 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 I would have loved to do more on that. And I just, I didn't have time to do it. Um, just one example is I was this real aha moment of doing research when I found out um, that a, a Filipino who had migrated to the US and was living in Chicago, I was a student in Chicago, um, was essentially on the executive board of what was in the interwar period sort of the most um, important anti-colonial um, sort of spearheaded by communists, but was um, a um, non-communist organization meeting in Brussels, sort of the establishment of the League Against Imperialism, um, and that a Filipino American was on was on the executive board was really stunning to me because we, you know, we don't have this real sense of of anti-imperial activism in the post-World War period when, you know, there's been a number of books written about the so-called Wilsonian moment, but what about the sort of uh, Wilsonian moment within the, the colonies? Um, and so I was, it was really exciting. It didn't surprise me, you know, I, 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 I um, had hoped and I suspected um, that there was um, uh, activism, but to see it at this sort of the highest level in the League Against Imperialism was just like a real exciting moment. Uh, thanks for that. Thanks for that wonderful question, Paul. Um, yeah, just just thinking on this. I mean, uh, one thing that jumps to mind is is that there, um, to the best of my knowledge, there is no comprehensive study of uh, the Lumad experience of of U.S. colonialism and, and sort of um, uh, U.S. colonial efforts uh, on on Mindanao with Lumad groups. Which, um, you know, again, I, I sort of uh, uh, in the archives would would run sort of you know, peripherally up against uh, again and again, and, and they sort of um, peek into the book a bit, but, but really aren't dealt with in any kind of systematic way. And I, and I thought, you know, there are um, all sorts of, of endeavors from these, um, uh, you know, sort of nascent settler colonial plantations in Davao um, to um, uh, agricultural colonies that are that are set up, um, you know, kind of around like, you know, between like 1912 and 1920 uh, in Cotabato um, to uh, sort of amateur eth ethnography that are that is done by particular American uh, officials amongst Lumad groups um, that I think, you know, there there's uh, really, really a need to sort of explore that relational history um, in in a bit more depth, um, you know, than, than I was than I was able to do because of resources and, you know, because of training in my PhD and, and for other reasons. Um, the other thing, you know, that 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 I thought about um, on this particular topic was, um, and something I think that that Colleen's book does really admirably well is is sort of taking the story beyond the Second World War. Um, I I sort of fall fall trapped at the same um, uh, you know point of uh, termination and origin at that at that sort of 1939 to 1945 moment, um, but but the story of of what happens, you know, of what um, you know the Spanish sort of uh, kick off and, and the Americans continue and then and then the, the, the Philippine nation state post-independence um, uh, really sort of 
amplifies and expands in dramatic ways, you know, what happens in Mindanao, you know, that's only a paragraph or two in, in my book. And, and so I think that, um, you know, considering this, this longer uh, history uh, of colonial aggrandizement and dispossession, displacement, um, you know, capital violence uh, in, in Mindanao in, in, a, in a more sort of synthetic um, a long way that, that comes right up into the 20th, 21st century because I mean, it continues uh, today. I mean, I had disruptions to my research, you know, I had research trips canceled to, um, because of what happened in Marawi in 2017. So the legacies are, are all still there. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think that, that, you know, somebody who, who sort of bridges that, that World War II moment in the way that Colleen's done so wonderfully in her book, I think uh, for, for the Southern Philippines, that would be, that would be a great project. Well, thank you. Um, well, we've run out of time, um, unfortunately, but um, in closing, on behalf of my co-editors, I'd just like to thank our authors. I'd like to thank all of you for attending at a time when we are all stressed out and have lots of things on our mind. Uh, but I think these kind of opportunities are really crucial, you know, during COVID and also after COVID in terms of uh, intellectual camaraderie coming together um, to celebrate kind of uh, uh, and ask questions about uh, emerging works and to kind of inspire future work. So, um, so I'd like to thank all of you for attending. Um, we have another uh, wor workshop questions um, coming in on January. So you'll be hearing from us um, about that. But in the meantime, uh, yeah, uh, I'd just like to uh, thank you all for coming. Those of you who sent questions that we weren't able to get to, my apologies, but the authors will have your Q&A and we're hoping that this is just the beginning of a series of long ongoing uh, fruitful conversations. So thanks very much again, and hopefully we'll see some of you in January.